I just want to invest in people that really want to be the best that they can be. Hello everyone, this is Todd Screema and my good friend Robin Lavaster here talking about how to be a top 10% salesperson. So sales for me is one of those topics where uh, I became enthralled with. Um, ever since I was a little boy, my father ran a, uh, a company and a lot of his clients were back east and he was the only salesperson. And so I woke up every morning and I'd go get my Cheerios or my Lucky Charms and I would listen to him make phone call after phone call as I'm eating my, cheer my Cheerios. And that was my introduction into sales. So I love this topic. Uh, I think sales is the lifeblood of any business. And I think we're gonna give you some really good tactics um, on, on this podcast uh, that is, is, uh, will help anyone in business. I don't care if you're a preacher running a church and you need more people, um, or if you're an insurance agent, or if you're a realtor, or if you're a loan officer, uh, everyone's in sales because sales is about influence. So uh, I wanna introduce Robin Lavasser. Robin is literally one of my favorite people in my life. Uh, we met 10 years ago. I remember uh, I was with Dave Kammer, the branch manager at, at the time, and we went and had dinner. And he says, you got to meet this Robin girl. There's something special about her. And um, she's doing okay, you know, closing four or five loans a month, but I think she could be a superstar. And so we get about halfway through dinner and, and Robin, you may remember it different. I, I don't think I've ever talked to you about this, but I remember looking at you and saying something like, you have it. Like, I don't, you know, when you do meet a lot of people, thousands of people over the years, you just meet certain people and she had it. Um, so let me tell you this, the first year, I just asked her, cause I forget the first year she worked for, for Summit cause we worked together. She runs an office up in Eugene, Oregon and she personally does home loans for a living. Uh, so she's a loan officer. She, she closed 52 loans the, the year, first year we worked together. Last year, she closed 633 loans for $194 million in volume. To put that in perspective, uh, that's top one-tenth of 1% 1 of the nation. I mean, there might be, I'm totally guessing, um, educated guess, because um, I consult to the industry, but it's there's probably 50 loan officers in the country who did that, that kind of volume. Um, so she's fabulous. Robin, thank you for joining us. Um, Tell us a little bit about, tell us a story about your sales, you know, how you got into it so people get to know you a little bit. Yeah, you know, I, I remember being, so I'm from a small town in Southern Oregon. And when I, you know, nobody really grows up and says, I want to be a salesman. And I think it's interesting, right? I think we all end up somehow seeing somebody do it and then realizing that, hey, this is something I could do too. You know, a lot of people, I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a nurse. I'm going to be a firefighter. But really, you're exactly right. Sales being influence, uh, you, I, I think there's an attraction to it that you either have or you don't have. Um, and if you do have it, when you get the right tools applied to it, it can really do something special. And so I watched a woman and, and she was a little crazy in mortgage, but she had, you know, two car phones and three pagers. And she was this powerhouse 30-year-old woman selling. And I watched her influence people from the moment she walked in the room. Like you could just feel her energy. You could, you know, you could, I mean, the, the old saying goes, you're patting heads and kissing babies and, you know, shaking hands or whatever you're doing. And she was that person. And so I happened to be a temporary receptionist for her. And I'll never, I'd never met her. I was working, you know, answering the phone from some gal that had taught me. And here comes this woman. And there was something about her energy that I just went, I don't know what she's doing, but I'd like to know more. Um, and that was my first real introduction to the energy and influence that you have to bring to sales. Mm. But I think it's, you're, you are, and, and this is, a, this is a, a myth in the sales world is people think you have to be that large gregarious person. And you and I in our travels know tons of people that you being one of them that, that not really a, a natural born, what people would think of as a natural born salesperson, but yet here you are, you know, in your career being literally the top in your field. And so um, it's, it's very interesting to me. I talk to so many individuals and they think, well, of sales, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, the old 
I call it the 80s way of thinking about sales, like you're a hard, hard closer and stuff. I don't feel that way at all. I don't think I've ever hard closed anybody. I, I'm, I, you probably haven't either. I, I am direct sometimes, but I'm not, hey, if you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it. You know, I was talking to a big opportunity last night and uh, I flat out told him, I said, hey, if this is not for you or you don't feel that it's the right decision and you feel you've got the proper information, it's okay. And, and I really mean that, like, I don't want to push deals. So uh, let me go over some ideas and then we're going to talk about uh, a few ideas around sales, four steps to a sale, but most of our time is going to be these 10 tactics that, uh, that I've outlined. And for some of you that are watching this visually, uh, I'll do a little share screen uh, a couple times so that you can see that. I think that the, the first thing that I will tell you as far as big, big ideas is sales really is influence. So if you're a mom, you're influential. If you're a dad, you're in, in order to do your job well, you have to influence people. You've got to get them from point A to point B. That's the best definition that I have found of sales. The second thing is sales is a contact sport. I always tell people, I don't care what line of work you're in. If you're a car salesperson, if you never meet anybody, no one's going to want to buy a car. You've got to put yourself in that scoring position. So we're going to talk about how to do that. Uh, and then I put on here more value, more sales. And what I mean by that is you have to put that person's best interests uh, in line. I, I was talking to someone yesterday. I said, you remember the, the three parts to, um, to raving, the, the famous book, Raving Fans? And it's know what you want, know what the customer wants, and then give plus 1% service. The, the plus one percent is the value piece. It's the a little bit over the top. Uh, you know, it's like uh, as Rob and I have gotten to know each other personally and professionally. It, like what I get from her is this: if I ever have a bad day, I'll call Robin. You know, we're we're had a a great year, but a but a really difficult year. And I remember calling her on the way home one night, and I'm like, who can I call? And just kind of, I, I need a little uplift. And it was Robin. Um, and she's, that's what I do for her. And, you know, I hope what she's gotten from me is how to build some teams, how to get a little better at sales, how to understand process. And she's one of the best students I've ever seen, but that's giving back to each other. If, if I'm getting business from someone, I've got to give more than I get. And that's, that's a very simple concept and salespeople tell me they do it all the time and I don't see it. So Robin, give me an example, put you on the spot here. Yep. Um, one or two things you did that was over the top, uh, plus 1% service, one or two quick stories, just so people understand. Yeah. I mean, I think that, so I, I love the relationship piece of the sale. Um, and I think that you said it exactly right, Todd. And I think it's a valid point that I just want to emphasize for a minute. I was enamored by the, the magnetic and the energy. You also can just follow a process for the sale and it will work, right? And so like you said, you don't have to be a bigger than life personality. You might be more comfortable, but they normally follow less process. People that will follow the process will generally be more successful, I would say. Um, and so that's, that's actually, I think a, a myth in sales that you just have to be larger than life. If you can find the magic of both, it gets really special and then delivering the plus one. And so for me, I think about plus one moments with clients and I think about, um, you know, opportunities to serve them, whether it be a referral partner or a borrower, those are our clients right now. Um, you know, I had a family who was literally moving and there was a delay because it was a, you know, domino transaction and I coordinated where to put their animals, like networked with people where to put their animals in order to make sure that they had the least amount of stress in a mortgage transaction as possible that was going a little bit sideways, but out of everybody's control. And so what we can control, what we can do. And I think that part of the sale is not kind of saying, hey, this is this part's my job, somebody else will do these other things. It's really being engaged with your client through the entire process of whatever you signed up to help them with, right? Like whatever you're engaged with being part of in their lives, you have to truly be invested in not just your portion, but the outcome. Yeah. You know, yeah, I tell you one thing for me, just one simple tactic is every single time I hear of someone having a bad day or I've talked to them and they, they sound frustrated or they had a, a family member die or anything like that, I just text my assistant Susan and say, send flowers, here's what to say, you know, and it's just, it's just a little plus 1%. The flowers aren't, it's not going to change someone's life, but 
it does make a difference. And I used to never do that stuff. I was just, I do a really good job. I was very, um, I don't know, linear about that process. And what I've learned is when you, when you constantly are adding little pieces to that emotional bank account, it does come back to you. And so that don't do it because of that, do it just because you have a big heart and you want to help people. But, um, Let's slide over to the four steps to a sale. Um, four steps, contact, rapport, close, and follow-up. So just to explain each one, contact is how many contacts I need to make in order to receive a referral or rece receive a lead. Rapport building is, hey, what, what are you really looking for? Understanding what the client wants, knowing how to solve the problem. The close would be the actual signing of the contract or uh, closing of the loan, or they drive away with the car. And then the follow-up is the follow-up. Um, so I've taught a lot of sales classes and I, I, I've given, I, I've had the talks like this to hundreds of people. And I will say, how many of you are best at these four things? So you can only pick one. And um, when I go through contact, two or three people out of 300 raise their hand. I say rapport, about 80% of them say, I'm, I'm just a people person. Then the close, you know, another 20% or so, and then the follow-up, you know, very few hands. What I will tell you is that that, that, that in, a, in and of itself is that it, when you see it visually, uh, it always shocks me, but I've done it so many times, it doesn't. Um, where the money's at, where the win is, is the first one. It's the contact. What people are naturally, what comes most naturally is, uh, well, I'm meeting you in person and I, I get the sale. Well, the reason that that happens is because people like people. And how many people have you met out of 100 people and you, you walk out away from the meeting, whether it's at a cocktail party or a business setting, and you're like, I hate that person. That person's horrible. You almost never do it. It does happen one out of a thousand people, but it almost never happens. The issue is that the contact piece, and as we get into some of these things, I want people to understand that it pains me to no end that people who don't do the con have a contact plan, it it really re then they wonder why they're they go through these peaks and valleys and all that stuff. So, just share with me briefly, Robin, a quick story about how you learned how to be so consistent with your contact because you're excellent at it. I think what I realized was the value of the initial contact. And so one of the things that is allows me to take the emotion out of it is the money piece, right? And so, um, hey, if, if what we see in the money is the follow-up, right? The close and the follow-up, that's where it feels like it is. But what, what I think you're exactly right, you have to go back to the beginning. And so the contact is what really creates the, and not that every sale is about money, but it's, I mean, ultimately we're driving income, right? And so, hey, if you're not doing that contact, you're never gonna get to the last two steps. And so I had to really realize how, what the number was. And so for my biggest transition in business, you know, this year was Mortgage Disneyland, but my biggest transition in business period was understanding what I wanted to achieve and then how many contacts it truly took and measuring that, right? Like really looking at it every single month and saying, this is my average close. This is what I can do with this many contacts. And so in my business personally, it's that I have to drive in a hundred leads a month. In order to do that, I have to talk to 30 people a day. So to drive in a hundred leads, I have to talk to 30 people in some fashion, right? It could be over lunch, coffee. It could be at a barbecue, interacting with people belly to belly. It could be on the sidelines of my children's game. It's, it's, I have to be in contact with 30 people a day in order to drive a hundred leads to my business that cr really created the initial business that I wanted. Um, and, and as long as I never miss those hundred leads coming in with those 30 contacts, that's how I stopped porpoising, if you will, in business and kind of going up and down and riding a roller coaster versus driving exactly what I wanted and feeling in control of the result, whether it was a good result or a bad result, it was really me who could, change the outcome of that yeah you, 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 your point her point is you control your contact right i'll tell you a quick story this is one of my favorite stories because it, it really changed my life so uh i was a new loan officer i'm about one year in the business and i i i, st I started selling when i was 16 years old my dad had me go out and try and sell vending machines door to door for a whole summer that's what i did all day is cold calls and i didn't get one sale 
So don't ask me why I got into sales, but I did. I shouldn't have because I, I was so down on myself. But then fast forward, I had some success in other companies and I graduated college, got into the mortgage business. And I was like, hey, um, I'm doing, you know, as a brand new loan officer first year and I'm, I'm start closing three, four, five, six loans sometimes a month. And then I had a month where I closed one loan. And I was like, Todd, you idiot. You, you worked 160 hours plus I was working a lot of overtime and you, you got one result. Something's wrong, right? And uh, I said, who's the best salesperson I know? And there was this guy who Rob and I work with today, Dan Miller, and he was a big title rep, right? He had hundreds of clients. And I'm like, man, he looked good. He smelled good. He, I just had met him. So I called Dan. I said, hey, would you meet with me? Uh, I'm, I really could use some help. He says, yeah. I said, well, um, Todd, what's the problem? I said, I closed one loan last month and I feel like an idiot. I'm beating myself up. I'm frustrated. I'm embarrassed. I'm angry. I've got every negative emotion you could think of. And he says, well, I'm going to tell you what to do, but you won't do it. Just like that. I was like, well, Dan, you're just getting to know me. It's our second meeting. I said, I'll do whatever you say. Uh, like I'm super coachable. And he says, no, you won't. I said, I swear I will. He says, okay, call 10 people a day, every single day of your life. And I said, what do I say? He says, up. Ah! Well, what do I do? Up. Ah! I'm like, dude, what's wrong with you? He says, I'm not telling you anything else. He says, because you won't do the first one. And I said, if I track it every single day that I make 10 outbound calls to get appointments to try and get leads, will you meet with me again? He said, yes. And I tracked it every single day. So next month, go, the whole next month, 30 days, I'm doing this plan. The next time I met with him, I was closing eight loans. I had gotten, I forgot how many leads, but it was more than I'd ever gotten by double and it just worked, okay? And so when we talk about this and we start going into these 10, 10 tactics, um, the first one is a simple daily plan. So I put on here what I use my whole life, 10 outbound calls, three appointments a day. Now you heard Robin say 30 outbound calls, but you're talking about a super, 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 superstar. So be careful, you know, you gotta read between the lines. For most salespeople, making 10 outbound contacts, not a text, not an email, not a video. These are people, you should do all those other things, but that's, that's the contact plan. And I don't care what business you're in, if you're selling jets, or if you're a preacher of a church and need more people, if you called 10 people a day and said, will you please bring a friend this Sunday? Your church will blow up, right? Because you would have 50 people, maybe half of them bring a guest. You got, you know, two more guests. So that's 50 more people in a small church. Pretty soon it's 100 people. Pretty soon it's 500 people. So these things are so simple, but people won't stick to number one. So my question to you, Robin, is why is it so hard for people to stick to a simple sales plan? Well, I think it's a two things. One, when you go into something with the desire to gain something back for yourself is the initial, the initial reason you're calling, right? People can smell that a mile away, right? It's why car salesmen unfortunately have a terrible reputation often because you get on that lot and they're chasing you down with, let me sell you something, let me sell you something. You know, in real estate and lending and maybe across the world, we call it commission breath, right? Like it's somebody, and so I think that's a turnoff. And when people say the word sales, I know for me, when somebody was like, you're in sales, I was like, no, no, I do mortgages. I didn't even want to say the word because it felt like I was simply going after something that was self-serving. That's how I saw sales. And, and what I've realized is that you're exactly right, the value of the sale. And so why are we calling to connect? Are we only calling? Is the only reason I'm calling if they can do something for me? Or is the reason that I'm calling because I'm genuinely interested in starting a relationship with them that hopefully would add mutual value between the two of us, right? Is there something I bring to the table that they also would bring to the table that there is a benefit to both? And I think that that is the miss is that people go, oh, I have to sell. It's cold calling. I just have to dial and hope somebody 
is nice enough to talk long enough to give me what I want, instead of thinking, how do I find out maybe what their need is and then see if I can fill it. And in turn, people mirror that behavior back and say, hey, what can I now do for you? Yeah. You know, th there's a theme that's already going on here that I hope you're listening to. And that is, I call it give to live, right? Givers gain. Those are, those are terms that we use. And, and it's so ingrained in me. I'm out, when I meet with someone, literally all I'm thinking is, how do I help this person? And I think part of the reason for my success is I just think that way. I feel that way. I, 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 once a month, I'll count the money and all that stuff. And that's fun too. But the rest of the time, I'm just like, how do I help this person? How do I truly pour into them? Um, I, last night, I, I was talking to someone. And um, again, it was a potential opportunity for my company. And I talked him out of it. I said, bud, I really think this other direction is based on the values that you told me, your values-based decision, what's going to serve your life is the other choice. Now, listen, that probably cost me several hundred thousand dollars a year, but it was the right thing to do. And somehow, some way, that's going to come back. I believe that. I believe that my, not, not that that gentleman's going to send me a referral tomorrow or something, but somehow, some way that comes back. Tip number two is track your leads and your closing percentage. I'm going to tell you my thoughts on this and then ask Robin her thoughts. So this is so important. So here's what clicked for me. I was, I was tracking all my leads. I learned to track, write down all my leads on this silly form called Lead Tracker. And uh, Robin and I still use it today. And it dawned on me after doing that for a couple months that if I got 20 leads a, in a month, that I would close five deals. And it was, it was consistent. I mean, plus or minus 10% a month, but over the course of two, three months, it, it averaged out that way. And, um, and so I, I started just tracking every single lead. And so 20 leads a month is one a day. So then my mindset shifted to one lead a day and, and 20 leads a month. So if, I'm sh if I don't get a lead on Monday the 1st, I got to get two leads on Tuesday. I'm not going to beat myself up. I just know what the number is. And going back to what Robin mentioned is it made business a lot less stressful and a lot less emotional for me because I was, I, I was one of those 100% commission people that was a total emotional mess until I learned this. So Robin, your thoughts on tracking leads. Yeah, I mean, I think two things. So one is, I think that we think we do a good job of tracking leads, but the truth is we do a good job of tracking deals. And here's, here's what I mean by that. Most of the time, I think people in general oh, somebody walked in the door and bought that car today, or, or you know, two more people came to church and tithed, or whatever the case, they track that as um, the, you know, the lead. That's truly, that's actually a transaction at that point. And so, yes, you add the lead. Where I changed in my own business was when I was standing on the sidelines at a football game, you know, I'm a mom, I realized that as I was making conversation with fellow parents, I would ask questions that would lead into my, you know, my sales world, basically. And, and really, they are just out of curiosity, simple things like, what do you do for a living? Mm -hmm. Well, in turn, people ask you, what do you do for a living? You know, those kinds of things. I realized that on those sidelines, people would say things to me like, oh, yeah, we plan on buying a house, you know, we'll have to call you. And for years, Todd, I spent time going, yeah, for sure, call me. You know, it's kind of like that. We should do dinner sometime. Nothing else ever happened. And the reason it doesn't happen is one, we don't remember. We like to think we do, but we don't remember. And then two, we're, we're afraid of giving ourselves permission to that follow-up often with those tracking mechanisms. And so what I realized is now my husband, for instance, the other night was at our neighbor's house and they were saying, hey, we should probably look at refinancing. We split the cost of a fence to be done between us. And hey, we should probably look at refinancing. Isn't that what your wife does? He came home and told me, I literally put it on the re lead tracker, found their phone number, called them the next day and said, hey, the old me, Todd, would have waited for them to call me. They'll call me when they need me. The truth is, it's my job to serve them. They have a need that I know I can fill. How do I be the one that follows up and actually meets that need? And so I've learned you track everything. Hey, I have a neighbor three doors down that's going to sell their house. The realtor should be following up with the neighbor three doors down or finding out how to get their contact info. The lead tracker actually allows you to do that. 
and we we just don't do a good enough job of realizing what a lead actually is and then giving ourselves permission to really go after it not to go get paid but to really fill the need that you know you fill well for that person robin i had a coach tell me this once um you know if you're a uh, a salesperson and someone brings up a need and then you don't follow up or you don't get their phone number and stuff it would be like me going to a restaurant and you're the waiter and I sit down and you say, Todd, come with me. I'll show you where the steaks are. You can cook it up yourself. You know, it's like, no, you, you said, Todd, that, that sounds ridiculous when I say it that way. That's what you're doing. And you, sometimes you have those one conversation and hopefully you're, you're going to get two or three out of this meeting. That's like, that's a before and after moment. Like that, that, that for me, that was a before and after moment, learning to track my leads and then having that discussion with that coach when he said, well, go back and cook your own food. And I was like, whoa. So uh, the next one is know how to build rapport with different personality types. Um, so we'll go a little bit quicker on some of these. Uh, to me, you, you, you know, people call it mirroring, matching. Uh, there's all these terms. Act like they act. You know, uh, Robin and I have pretty similar personalities, so I, I'm I'm not thinking that. But if but if I met someone and they uh, are dressed extremely conservatively and they talk really slow, uh, and they walk slow, I probably need to slow down. Uh, there is all kinds of, all kinds of books on this and uh, disc testing and personality testing, but the basics is you want to, people like people like themselves, you know, and, and it's just like, if I, if I socially go to a gathering and I, I am a little, I'm more outspoken than most people, and someone doesn't talk to me at all and won't chat with me at all, it almost feels weird. It feels weird. That's the same thing. You, you got to know how to do that. So Robin, one, one tip on that from you. I, I couldn't agree more. I think one, it's matching people's um, it's matching people's energy level and pace of conversation, all of those things. And then the other piece of it is learning learning who they are. And so I really encourage everybody to study a little bit on personality types. There's tons of info. It's too much to get into on here, but really important, I think, to study it and understand. And you can learn really quickly. There's quick tips on just, hey, building quick rapport. Hey, I love that purse. I love your shoes. I almost lead into every conversation with a compliment. I just start there because we don't do enough of it as human beings in general. We don't start with nice things. We start with awkward like, nice to meet you. Hi, follow me back. You know, let's go talk those kind of things instead of, Hey, where'd you get those jeans? I love them. Hey, what, you know, what's it, you, you look tan. Have you been on vacation lately? Like how do you ice break? And I, I, that would be my one other tip is just ice break better with people be engaged, really notice things and then compliment what they're something they have on something they're doing. Yeah. That's it. When I teach people cold calling, I'm like, start the first step is honor. Hey, Robin, I just saw you had your best year ever. You know, that would be honor or any kind of sincere compliment. Um, next one says, know what the customer wants. Boy, this is a big one. Um, I got this years ago. So years ago, again, my first year in the mortgage industry, um, someone got sick, couldn't go to this big seminar. And they said, hey, new kid, fill his spot. So I went. This guy gets up on stage the second day and says, I make a million dollars a year. I'm gonna teach you exactly what I do. And he taught a process that I stole called the two-step close. And the main ingredient to that closing process and is really get clear on what the customer wants. And so how you do that is very similar to how Oprah Winfrey did it and Dr. Phil does it, is you really ask a lot of questions and they tend to be why-based type questions. So I might say, if Robin is thinking of buying a car from me, I might say something like, uh, what is your biggest concern when you buy a car? And she might say, payment, I can only spend so much. Payment's important, why is that important to you? You know, and we go down this road of discovering, oh, you just had a, another kid, so you need a bigger car, and your husband just lost his job, and we can only afford a $300 payment, got it. And she feels like I listened because I did, 
Robin? It, 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 well, what you just said, Todd, it, I think is so important. And just like, I just want to emphasize it. A lot of us, you know, steal frame. And here's what I mean by that. When, when you just said, hey, what's the most important thing in buying a car? If I said back payment and you answered me with, okay, payment's important. Yeah, so we'll see what we can do on that. Keep going, right? Instead, you said, why is that payment important? One of the biggest misses is actually asking a question that does not divert to another subject, it simply goes deeper on what you just asked. And I think it's one of the biggest misses in communication in general with people is that we say things like, hey, Todd, where are you from? And yeah. you might say California and I say, uh, you know, oh, I'm from Oregon. I just stole it back, right? I didn't say how was, you know, oh, you're from California. Tell me more about California. That's one of the biggest misses in sales, I think, is that going deeper with the questions to get people to, we all give surface answers all the time in life. We're trained to do it. How do you get somebody to pause, think about their answer and actually dig in that deep enough that you're getting the truth that will help you serve them? Yes, and that's the key. And Robin, I think people don't dig more, A, because they're, they, they've got a bad habit of not doing that, but B, they don't want that because it's a little, con there's a little conflict there when you're like, well, why? And then Robin looks at me and says, well, my husband actually just lost his job because of COVID. Now she's sharing personal soul type stuff, heart, heart based stuff. And that's where the decision is made most of the time. So you want to, it, yes, it's about serving your customer, but it's, it's getting them to open up. Uh, some people call it opening the kimono, right? It's, it's that kind of idea. And this one, you know, we could spend a whole segment just on this because it's so, so critical. Um, create a consistent sales presentation. So Robin, this is a quick one for me. Uh, I don't care what you're doing. Have something that's visual. Most people are visually oriented first. And so um, when you think of a sales presentation, there's got to be some way to use it. So I was taught a sales presentation years ago. I mean, it was... 28 years ago. And I use the same presentation. I, I, I'm, I don't personally do loans anymore. I have not given that presentation for probably 15 years. I could do it verbatim because I literally did it thousands of times. And part of, part of the reason that you do that, it's an open-ended presentation, by the way. So I'm customizing it to who I'm talking to. There's a lot of open-ended questions. So it's not a, a, a really canned it's, it, it, mine was about 10 visual aids that were cues on what to talk about and then turn the page and talk about the next subject. So Robin, I'd love your thoughts on this because I think people do a horrible job on this. <laughs> I, I would agree. And I, what I realized was one of the, the detriments to my business was winging it, right? Winging it and then later somebody being disappointed and me thinking, did we discuss that? Did we talk about that option? And all of a sudden, everything you've built might be something that they feel betrayed on because you simply didn't follow a process that makes a big difference. And so I realized that I had to be much better at following the process to really not only be good myself, but to serve the client at the highest level and cover all the points that you need to cover. Um, and, and that really makes them feel cared for, right? It's when you go into a doctor's office, they, they do the following process to every patient, no matter what, and they do it several times. You'll notice that. That to me is a sales presentation in terms of them understanding who you are, what you want, what the need is, you know, it just, that whole process. And so I do the exact same thing, Todd. I follow a key points. Um, I have some visual for the clients, but I also have visual for myself. And then I actually check it off and make little notes on anything that would be pertinent about that little step in the process that I know I maybe need to hold on to later. Maybe it's a cue. Like you said, you send flowers. Maybe somebody mentions they just got a new puppy. Hey, I'm getting a gift out to them. You know, there's lots of opportunity to not only deliver the information you need to deliver, but then also get to know the client if you're following a process, right? There's moments of data and then there's moments of relationship. Yeah, what I just wanna highlight what Robin's saying. What she's saying is because you have a process you follow and you've got it down pat, you can truly tune in and listen and be present with the, with the, with the person. And that, that's what she means when she says that. And this is one that is easily skipped over. I'm just telling you this, this should be one that everyone works on. Um, 
Next one is physical dressing grooming. This is a hot button for me because it's so easy to fix. If there's one thing to fix on here that you can literally get done in a week, this is it. Um, guys, I got some advice for you. Trim your nose hairs and trim your ear hairs, okay? It is not attract, it, it makes you come across when you got nose hairs hanging out your nose. It makes you, they immediately subconsciously think this person just doesn't really care about themselves. So they're not really gonna care about me. Um, when I give people homework on this, if they can afford it, I'm like, hey, hire a stylist for 50 to 80 bucks an hour. So, and, and, and they will come dress you and wear whatever they give you, okay? Because people are visual and they look at you and they're, they'll just be like, wow, you know, now it's, it, it, it doesn't, I'm not saying Gucci. That's not what I mean. There's, I'm not saying spend, you don't have to spend a lot of money on this, um, but color coordination. You know, that's a big one for men, especially. Um, so this is such a simple one. And it bugs me why people don't pay attention to themselves because it portrays you as being a mess. Robin, give me some thoughts on this one. You know, it's interesting. The real estate industry has, you know, a wide variety. And I think as entrepreneurs, which are most salespeople in general, you have different choices, right? And, and somebody said something to me years ago that's always stuck with me. And that's if you are with a client, but you are the professional, people should always be able to differentiate which is which. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make, and this is that even in the mirroring, the truth is, if I go into a sale, I found myself in my early years in the business, mom, you know, young, I've been in the business, since I was 19, I would bump into a client and, you know, it, it was the day that I was in jeans and maybe a hooded sweatshirt, you know, didn't think I was going to see somebody. And next thing you know, I have a referral of, you know, some great client walking in the door and I'm apologizing all over myself and instantly my confidence level to deliver what I need to deliver is diminished, right? Um, and, and, I'll, and I think that the world has gotten a little lackadaisical in this. And what I've learned is that I'm in my best mindset when my hair is done, when my makeup is on, when my, when my clothing matches the activity I'm going to do. If you went to the gym, you wouldn't wear stiletto heels and, uh, you know, a dress. You would go in gym clothes because it's appropriate. When we go to work and we're actually delivering service to people, it's appropriate to look professional so that you can deliver professional help to them. I totally agree. I'll use, well, I'll give you one metaphor and we'll move on. You wouldn't want to go to Disneyland with your kids, walk up to Mickey and see that he's got a bunch of stain all over his face and his fur, like coffee stains. Like you, you would instantly think, what are they doing? That's what your clients are saying when you have the nose hairs and the shoes that don't match. And, you know, the, you're, you're wearing a, a, a bright, for, lime green shirt, you know, it's, it's just, these are things that we're trying to appeal to an audience because we're on stage. So be on stage for your client. Number seven is not asking for the sale. Oh, um, I'll give you just one simple tip is when they give you buying signals, close. Don't keep selling. And, and the close should be easy. Uh, by the way, the form of closing is money exchange or a signature. That, that's, that's the close. So a money exchange or a signature. So that's when you know that you've closed. So Robin, your thoughts on that closing, because a lot of people struggle with this. Yeah. I, I mean, I struggled with it, I think for a really long time. And I, I think that where I struggled with it is that we're afraid to communicate what we think is obvious, right? But it's actually not. And I think this is in all sorts of communication styles. But I think at the end of the day, I would have a conversation. I'm a lender. I would be speaking to a realtor. It would go really well. And I would think to myself, okay, why haven't you sent me any business? But the truth is you coined this with me um, and probably everybody else and it's probably a phrase, the buddy sale. And so I spent my time building friendships with them and expecting them to realize that I wanted to work with them as well professionally. And my biggest aha in all of that was that you do have an opportunity to be both, but most people have enough friends and it might turn into that later, but you are there to provide a service, right? You are there to, to work together, essentially. And so I really learned that not only did I have to say, well, I do home loans, 
call me, you know, my fingers are crossed right now. Like, please, please, please. That's unintentional sale. And instead I would say, Hey, I do a home loan and I'd love to be the lender that you work with. Right? Like it's, there's a huge transition there that I used to be afraid of. Um, and, and when you really know that you're serving people at the highest level and doing all the other steps, Todd has been, you know, explaining to you, the truth is you, it's selfish to not say, I want to be your lender so that they know that you want to provide your help, that you're, you you want to be one of the best. Why wouldn't you be the one to take care of that person? hundred percent, hundred percent. Uh, number eight is something that Robin and I are both coaches. We're passionate about it. Always have a coach and meet with them regularly. Um, I will tell you that, gosh, well, let, let, let me tell you, I, I just came back from my first vacation in a year because of COVID. So I go to Mexico with a bunch of friends. I, 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 we just play golf every day. That's what we do. So I'm with my friend. My friend is six foot two. He's 52 years old. He's ripped. Very, just very um, lean, muscular. Played uh, division one sports in two sports. So he's a great athlete. We play golf, which we play golf, you know, four or five times a year. In one round, he hit 12 balls out of bounds. And he just, he, but he loves golf. He's always texting me, let's play golf. So I, I set him down one night. I'm like, bud, just, I will pay for 10 lessons. Like, I just go get 10 golf lessons. And here's the reason I say that. Um, every skill is learned. Every skill is learned. And so the skill transfer, the lack of skill transfer and the lack of eagerness to get skills in, in, in my opinion, is, is a pandemic in itself. There's, there's any skill that you wanna learn, there's someone who coaches it. So if it's passionate to you, if it's important to you, go get a coach. Because if without that coaching, it's the skill transfer piece, doing it on your own, you will achieve maybe 10% of your potential. With a coach, you'll eventually, over the course of several years, you'll, you'll get 100%. Listen, there's no, I look at someone like Robin and she's very coachable and she's had coaches for how many years now? Uh, nine. Nine years, she's professionally coached. And her income, her production, well, you can see 52 loans to 633 loans. Every single person that, that has ever been in coaching long-term, that's what happens. And I don't care what, what, we're, what, what business we're talking about. So your, your spin on coaching, Robin, yeah, really this, passionate about this. This is probably one of my favorite topics. And I think it's the most, you know, coaching is quite a buzzword right now. There's all these people out there, you know, I'm a life coach, I'm a business coach. The truth is it doesn't even matter. You should be seeking mentorship. And, and, the, and the point of that is that uh, there's a lot of reasons. It's big old, bigger pile theory. It's iron sharpens iron, right? It's the ability to know, hey, Todd, you were a, a, an uber successful loan officer, and then you created an incredible mortgage company. You have, candidly, I mean, especially when I started with you, more money than me, earned more money than me, probably better credit scores. There's a lot of things. All those things don't make you a better, nicer human being, but there's definitely things, not that you're not, right? But there's definitely a ton of those things that why wouldn't I want to learn from you? And I think one of the things that we do is we actually spend 18 years drilling education into our children. And then all of a sudden, you know, maybe 24, maybe 26, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, now that real life matters, now that you're on your own, you you just get you you should have it all figured out and the truth is you should never have it all figured out you should always be learning from somebody who is doing something better than you john and i follow people who have great marriages right i i love to learn from people who have um a steadier faith than me i i mean i don't i don't even think it's just in business i think in life in general we need to be a little more humble and a little more willing to open ourselves up to learn from others and and really help each other grow in that arena so i can't i can't stress coaching enough yeah guys um, this is whatever you want to get better at get a coach it's uh, you know uh, for me i've been playing guitar since i was 13 or 12 or something I recently, uh, about eight months ago, got a new guitar coach and I'm enjoying guitar at a higher level than I ever have in my life. I mean, it's, I'm doing things I never thought I could do. And it's been eight months, right? So it's just, we can't stress this enough. I think it's a, it's, 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 it's a shame that people are too proud 
to go to people that are really good in their field and ask for some time, ask for some mentorship, ask for some help. You know, one of the things, Todd, that you said to me uh, years ago that's always stuck with me, and at the time I actually thought you were being a little aloof, um, if you will, and that was that struggling is a choice. And when you said it, I thought, that can't be true. Um, people, you know, struggle all the time. And then you you proceeded to really talk about the fact that, hey, if you, you know, um, are overweight, you could, you know, get a partner and eat better. You could meal prep. You can, you know, go into a gym. You can, if you're um, an alcoholic, there's hotlines and meetings and and all of these different things. And, and in sales, if you're not getting the result you want, why wouldn't you seek help in those arenas. And, and I think that what I've realized in general, and it, it almost sounds crass when you say it, and it's unintentional, struggling is a choice because there are so many options out there if you're willing to engage and become the student and we should all forever be students. So I, I just, I want to say, it's one of the best lessons you've ever taught me that I continue to teach other people. Thank you. Um, years ago, I saw a, a psychologist speak and he was a famous author. And I got to have dinner with him afterwards. And he says, Todd, people get exactly what they want in life. And this is about 20 years ago. And I argued with him. Then I thought about it over and over. I couldn't get it on my head. And he's, he kept on saying, people get exactly what they want in life. If someone wants to make 50 grand, they will make 50 grand. If someone wants to make 500 grand and they really, really want it, they will figure out how to make 500 grand. If someone wants a great marriage, they will figure it out. If someone wants to have better friendships, they will do it. And I have, so fast forward 20 years, he's 100% right. And most people who listen to this will disagree. I'm just telling you, watch yourself and watch other people. They get exactly what they want. So uh, number nine is target marketing. Target market larger, more productive accounts. Mo they're more profitable and they're also less time. So uh, I know I had an account, so I had several big accounts, but I had one big one that I got, totally changed my business because this one account gave me 10 units a month and I could get 10 more or 15 more from other places. And I, it took me an hour a week to go to a sales meeting. And then I would, they just sent all these deals to me. So target marketing, bigger, more productive accounts and accounts that you enjoy. And I, I struggled with this when my first several years in business. Um, fast forward to today, I, I know what, who my target is. I know who my clients are. They're growth minded. They want to grow. They want to always get better. And when I interview people and I do several interviews a week, that's the number one thing I look for because that's my client. What's, so target marketing and profiling who you're after is so critical. I made tons of mistakes early on where I'm calling on people and I didn't even know they didn't do any business. And it, so there's no benefit. I, even if they love me, they can't send me any business because they don't have any business, right? So Robin, your thoughts on that one. Yeah, I think I think it's a really good point of one, do they, they have the business to send? But the other part is as you evolve in sales, as you evolve in all these other steps and have a daily plan and, and do all the things that we're talking about, what you also are able to do is really hone in on who your ideal clients are and serve them at the highest level because it's mutual, right? It's a mutual relationship. When you're just starting out, we're all hungry. You know, you kind of take anything you can get, even if they don't fit. And the biggest mistake there is that people do that because they're going to forget to continue the contact plan, right? People do that because they're, they're going to continue to porpoise instead of, following this plan all the way through at all times. There isn't a plan, there isn't a step on this plan that you get to do away with at any point. Like, and I think that's important to say out loud. And when you are doing all of these things, what you find is better clients, better fits for you will come as long as you keep the plan going the entire time. And it'll help you top grade, if you will, right? Maybe you have a, a client who's, um, yes, they send you a lot of business, but they don't respect your process. They're not good. You know, if I had somebody right now that said, Robin, I need you every Saturday and Sunday at an open house from 10 to 4 p.m. If I didn't have other clients, I would say yes. But because I have other clients, I have the capacity to say, I'm not the right fit for you. 
and that's an okay thing, right? And so I think knowing who your target is and then not being afraid to top grade so that not only do you feel fulfilled in your business, but really in life, right? We spend 40 hours a week, maybe plus some doing what we're doing in any capacity, why wouldn't we want it to be the most fulfilling we can make it? And that's working with people that you end up enjoying that add mutual value. Yeah, hundred percent. Last point guys, and then we'll close up. This has to do with taking care of your top accounts and knowing who they are and writing them down and keeping them on a list. And I, I put on here, mail, call and visit your top 50 accounts every month. Now, for some of you, you might sell jets. So maybe you have 25 big clients. Uh, maybe someone else, they have, they're a dry cleaner and they have a hundred uh, big accounts. Um, every business, by the way, I, I brought up dry cleaners. My, my personal dry cleaner, uh, he and I go fishing, we're friends. I, during the pandemic, I stopped by, drop off some clothes and he looks sick and he's always so happy. And I, I said, hey, come over to my house tonight. We'll have a beer. I'll help you with your business. Long story short, I said, hey, he says, well, Todd, people aren't getting enough dry cleaning done. I said, you know, he had his tablet with him. I said, pull up my bill because I'm still dressing up, right? And he says, I said, yeah, your bill's down 15%, but it's not down 80% like my business is. I said, okay, so what would it, how many, how many Todd's do you have in your database where I'm spending 400 bucks a month, 500 bucks a month dry cleaning? And he's like, uh, did the math, did the math. He says, about 25 I said, okay. And we, I said, what can you do to focus on those people and then grow that from 25 to 50? And what would that do to your revenue? So we ran all the math. And if he just took care of those 25 and then grew another 25, his business would be doing 90% of what it did pre-COVID. And he was shocked. He says, Todd, I have 1,800 clients. I said, yeah, but most of them give you one shirt a month you know, or a wedding dress once a year. I said, those, those are not your target market. Your target market is me. And so that's what I mean by this is take a certain number of people, 25, 50, something like that. And just when I say, like, bring them into the fold, bring them into the family. You, you have a party at your house, they're invited. You know, you're going on a houseboat vacation. You got some room. You're, these are people you love to hang out with. Bring them, right? It's the, it's that. It's that kind of focus because they're bigger clients and they're repeat clients most of the time. So Robin, your spin on this. You know, I think that it's a couple things. I think one, there's no such thing as being a master salesperson and not being good at relationship. I, I just, I don't think that the two, you know, one thing that you do, Todd, as, as a, an owner of an uber successful mortgage company, you're massive and you could be an owner that I've never spoken to, right? But instead I have your personal cell phone number. And one thing that my husband remembered from the day that he met you was you've always remembered his name, always, you know, been a friend to him basically and engaged in family life, right? Like you, you understand who I am. Now I'm one of your big clients, right? Like that's, that's the, the truth of it. My realtors, I know their spouse's name, their, their children. I know things about them. And not only do I know them, but I, I engage in them, right? So if every time I called them, I said, Hey, this is Robin, have any business for me or a lead for me, that dry cleaner, you know, he's got 25 clients. And the truth is he should be checking in on every single one of them of how's COVID treating you, right? What can I do for you? You know, it's, it, do you have people unaffected? Those types of things. And I think that we miss that and we expect people to just show back up at some point. Again, choosing to struggle versus taking action and doing something. And so staying in contact with people, sometimes we think in our own minds, like, why would people be interested in me? The truth is staying in contact means you're interested in them. And so, yes, your marketing shouldn't be, you know, all about yourself and what you're doing. Everybody kind of unfollows people on Facebook that talk all day, every day, only about business. But when you give them a balance of, hey, this is Todd Scream on the golf course, loving these things, watching, you know, your daughter ride a horse, whatever it may be. And then, by the way, here's some great business data that I can also share with you. All of a sudden, people are willing to listen to both because they enjoy you and you've given them a piece of your Yourself and you've, you've invested yourself in a piece of them. Yeah, 100%. And guys, what we're, we're talking about all these things, I think this is one of the things that really makes business simpler, but it also makes it a lot more fun. You know, I'll tell you a test. I took this test about three, four years ago. Um, I, I, I was coaching somebody 
And I said, you know, who could call your cell phone right now and you would not want to answer it? And I took that same advice. I had two people. When I really asked myself that question, I just called them and said, hey, you're going to have to work somewhere else. Here's your time frame. I literally did it the next week. And it's hard to make those decisions, but I, I have those choices. I want to work with people that, that, uh, that I like, that energize me. And I think a lot of people get that, kind of, well, God, my top account you know, runs me ragging and cusses at my team. And I'm like, I hear those stories all the time. And I'm like, whoa, stop, time, time out. We got this wrong. Um, let, me, let, let me close up with a couple things. Um, number one, th this visual aid is on beyourbestseries.com. So anything that I talk about, I always have one visual so that you can have it in writing and keep it in front of you. I want you to use this as a checklist. So you look at it and say, hey, physical dress and grooming. Gosh, everyone always compliments me on how well I'm groomed and dressed, check. Uh, not asking for the sale. Oh yeah, professional, pre yeah, I don't have that. Take one a month, take one a month and just get it done. Just one a month. At the end of 10 months, you're gonna be in the top 10% if you were to master all 10. Um, so the visual is always on beyourbestseries.com. The second thing is, the growth exercise that I just mentioned, using this as a checklist. Number three, take this, whether you're watching this uh, uh, as, a, as a podcast or whatever, and forward it or text it to one friend. Just one. Because we want to get this word out. You know, when, when Robin, Robin's part of a superior coaching client, her client, this, I know this sounds crazy, but Th those clients pay her, uh, mm, what is it, about $5,000, three people on a call, about $5,000 to talk to her for an hour, okay? It's, this is big time knowledge, okay? And I, I want to get it out there. I just, some of these things are so basic and I, I, I want to help people. We want to help people. That's what this is all about is growing people and developing people. That's why I, I took time out of my schedule to start this. I don't make money from this. Robin doesn't make money from this. It's just to give back to all the clients that help us so much. I mean, there, there might be someone on our database, a financial planner that says, takes one tip and helps them make another five grand a month, okay? That's what we want. Um, the last thing is, I, Rob and I want to say thank you. you. Seeing you grow and seeing you develop and knowing the person that you are, and, and we, I wish I could just tell people about all the great gracious things that you do for the company and in your personal life. It's one of the biggest honors of my life is to see how you've grown and developed. It's inspiring. Uh, matter of fact, I told Robin for we we're chatting before this, I said, she does this thing called mom boss and it's a video once a week. How could, how could they get on mom boss? Is, is that possible? Yeah. If you, if you look me up on Facebook, I'm on there. I think they started posting it possibly to YouTube. I'll check with my gal, but it's on, it's on Facebook and I'm, I'm not private. So you can literally just follow me on there. And every Monday we post a video also on Instagram. I'm not private. So either one, and there's literally my mom boss series on there with just either one, two minute videos, just with quick glimpses of what it's like to be a mom and also want to have a career and the truth that we can be good at both. And how many kids do you have? Five. <laughs> <laughs> hey listen guys thanks for tuning in robin thank you for your time go thank out and make it a great day guys bye guys i just want to invest in people that really want to be the best that they can be